Gospel for the second Sunday of Advent is Mark 1, 1 through 8. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This is how it is written in the prophet Isaiah. Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare the way for you. A voice of one calling out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. John was clothed in camel's hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. He preached, One more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the strap of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your servant Mark, who was inspired by the Holy Spirit to record these words for us. Words that come to us in this time of Advent as we look back at your first coming, Lord Jesus, and look forward to your coming again. So, through your Holy Spirit and your Word, help us to know you better and to be prepared for your return. We ask Jesus in your precious name. Amen. You've probably noticed that Mark's Gospel doesn't have a Christmas story. It takes us back, uh, probably not before the birth of Jesus, but before his ministry begins, to John, who was baptizing in the Jordan River. As Mark records these events for us and reflects on them, again, inspired by the Holy Spirit to write this, he reflected on what Isaiah the prophet wrote, what we also read in our first lesson this morning in chapter 40, announcing that there would be a messenger who would come to prepare the way for Jesus. A messenger who came, actually, baptizing for the repentance of sins. A messenger who preached to us of the one more powerful than he that would come. And so I think it is good for us to consider what it is that he preached and particularly look at how it is that we ought to live out our lives in the power of the Holy Spirit as we celebrate Christ's first coming and look ahead to his second. And so I would like us to look at the last phrase that John spoke in our Gospel text this morning, that Jesus would baptize not with water, but with the Holy Spirit. And consider three works that the Holy Spirit does for us, or maybe we would say three things that the Holy Spirit is for us, as we continue to live out our life in great expectation, in hope, knowing that hope is a sure and certain knowledge of what is to come, of our being taken to eternity when Christ returns to do that. So we're just going to take then that one phrase from our gospel and use it as our jumping off place and look at nine scriptures 
shorter pieces of scripture that help us understand what may be three of the, of the most characteristic work of the Holy Spirit. It's not everything that the Holy Spirit does, but I think that as we see these three things, uh, we will get a good understanding of the work of the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit does help us as we live out the life that we have in Christ. And so we're going to look at the Holy Spirit as our, our teacher and guide. Uh, we're going to look at the Holy Spirit as our comforter. And we're going to look at the Holy Spirit uh, and the translation, the uh, translation that we're using this morning uses the words down payment of our inheritance. Others say a pledge or even a guarantee. So the Holy Spirit as teacher. We need to begin by understanding that our fellowship with God is based on God's gift of grace and faith to us. And understanding that it is absolutely necessary for us to have faith, that is to put our trust in the promises that God makes to us, primarily that our sins are forgiven, that we are declared not guilty in his court of law because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross and proven to us in his resurrection. So we find in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, For in the gospel a righteousness from God is revealed, by faith, for faith, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. So the righteous are those who have been declared not guilty of their sins when they have put their faith in, when they have put their confidence in, when they have put their trust in what Jesus has done for us. And so faith then is an absolutely necessary part of this fellowship, that God does give us this incredible gift through His, because of His grace, because He loves us and is merciful and gracious, He gives us even faith. And so uh, we see that faith is absolutely necessary, and we see that faith comes to us as a gift through His Word. So we read again in Romans, this time in chapter 10, verse 17, So then faith comes from hearing the message, and the message comes through the Word of Christ. And so we understand that the whole of Scriptures are God's Word, and since Christ is God, that is the Word of Christ, is the Scriptures. And as we hear the scriptures, as we hear the message that is the word of God, the word of Christ, that God does a miracle in us and gives us this gift that we call faith. We understand that in our broken old self, we cannot believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior. We cannot do anything by mental capacity or action, we cannot believe, but that we must be given this gift. The gift that God gives to us through the hearing of His Word. And then this is where the Holy Spirit comes in to the equation. Because it is the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, who comes to us then to be our teacher, to take the Word and open the truth of the Word to us so that we can hear it, receive faith, and put our confidence in what Jesus did for us on the cross. So then we read in John chapter 14, verse 26. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I told you. So Jesus was preparing his disciples 
for his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension into heaven, and told them that when he left, then the Holy Spirit would come. And the purpose of the coming of the Holy Spirit would be to teach us, to teach his disciples and us as his disciples, all things that Jesus had taught. And so then we understand that it is the work of the Holy Spirit to take the Word and the gift of faith that God gives us as we hear the Word and cause us to apply it in our trust and confidence in the promises that Jesus has given to us. So then the, the Word is used by the Holy Spirit to remind us of our sin, to drive us to Jesus, who is the one who forgives our sin, because he paid the penalty that we deserve for our sin. And then use the word to help us to live the life that God has called us to live in the world while we are waiting for Christ's return. We recognize that this waiting can be difficult. That there are many challenges that we face as we wait for Christ's return. It doesn't mean that life is necessarily bitter or harsh, but we do recognize that we do face the effect of sin in the world. And there is disease, and there is natural disaster, and there are accidents, and there are conflicts that cause harm and there is death. And so the second thing that the Holy Spirit does for us, uh, as we live out our life in the power of the Holy Spirit, is to be our comforter. We see that uh, in John 14 again, this time in verse 16, again Jesus is promising the coming of the Holy Spirit and he says to his disciples and to us, as we are his disciples, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. And so here the word counselor, uh, I suppose, can have a couple of different implications. Uh, a counselor can be one who advises, and we see that uh, in terms of the Holy Spirit, Spirit being our teacher. But it's also the one who, who counsels us in the sense that he is with us to carry us through all of the trials and tribulations, all of the struggles that we face as a part of our life in Christ in this world. As we are called to be in the world but not of the world. As we encounter uh, the difficulties of the effects of sin but also the difficulties that come to us because we are witnesses to Jesus and His Word. And uh, we put the word persecution on that. Uh, in our time, in our location here in the United States, uh, we have been uh, graciously given the gift um, that we can practice our religion freely without persecution. Uh, and yet in the rest of the world, many, many Christians suffer for their faith. Uh, and it may not be long before we also uh, lose the privileges that uh, being a part of this nation has offered us uh, and will encounter more and more persecution. And so we are comforted by the Holy Spirit as we live through that. Uh, so then we uh, read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6, You also became imitators of us, and of the Lord, when you welcomed the word during a time of great afflictions with the joy from the Holy Spirit. And so we see there that uh, as Paul is writing to the Christians in Thessalonica, and the Holy Spirit has preserved that letter so that it is God's word to us, we are encouraged in our time of great affliction to have joy because the Holy Spirit gives us joy. And we could also say that that joy is the Holy Spirit comforting us 
and being with us as we walk through the afflictions of this life. And then we also see the example of the work of the Holy Spirit in the early church. We read in Acts chapter 9, verse 31. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed peace as it was strengthened. It grew in numbers as it lived in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And here we actually have then the word comfort used. That as the believers lived in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, God increased their numbers. They grew in number. God built His church on earth through the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And so we then can uh, live in this gift that God gives to us as Jesus washes us and covers us and clothes us with the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit is our teacher and guide, that the Holy Spirit is our comforter through this life. And then, again, the theme of Advent, the whole point of Advent, is that we look forward to the second coming of Christ, and so then the Holy Spirit acts for us as the down payment of that inheritance. He is the pledge, or the guarantee, of eternal life. So we turn to Romans chapter 5, verse 13, where we're going to see uh, the looking forward to eternal life in the word hope. Now many, uh, sorry, as, as Paul is writing here, he's, he's actually uh, speaking a benediction uh, at the close of his letter to the Romans. And he says, Now may the God of hope fill you with complete joy and peace as you continue to believe so that you overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. We understand here that, yes, we are living out in these days our life on earth and God acts as our comforter in that, but that as believers in Jesus, we have something beyond this life to look forward to. And the word hope is used throughout the New Testament to indicate that blessed future. That the word hope here is not like hoping that we get snow for Christmas or hoping that we have a, a good weather for whatever outing we want to go on. It's not a wishful thinking. The word hope here is certain knowledge of a promise. And so by faith, which the Holy Spirit works in us through the Word, then we can have a, a true confidence of eternal life and the hope that we have by the power of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5.5 5 continues this idea. Indeed, through the Spirit, we, by faith, are eagerly waiting for the sure hope of righteousness. So what is the result of being declared not guilty? The word righteousness has to do with that declaration. That we are declared not guilty, and that declaration becomes effective for us when we by faith, trust that promise because Jesus took our place, took upon himself the punishment that we deserve for our sin. He died the death we deserve. And so, when then we are declared not guilty, not because of anything we do or anything we think or any reason that we have, but because of what Jesus has done for us, then we have this promise. And we can look forward, it says, eagerly waiting for the hope of righteousness. And the eagerly waiting is through the Holy Spirit. And so then the Holy Spirit is working this hope in us that 
as we continue to live out our life on earth, being taught through His Word as the Holy Spirit is our teacher, being comforted in our afflictions, because there are afflictions in our lives, we have something greater to look forward to. And then we see this word, this term, the down payment of our inheritance. Other translations would say the pledge of our inheritance, or uh, we might even use the term the guarantee of eternal life. So we find this in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In Him, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and in Him, when you also believed, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. He is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of God's own possession, so that His glory would be praised. We go back to John's message, that the one more powerful than He who was coming would baptize us with the Holy Spirit. And as the Holy Spirit is inspiring the Apostle Paul to write to the Christians at Ephesus, he tells them that they have been sealed by the promise Holy Spirit. We could say baptized with the Holy Spirit. And the effect of that is that the down payment has been made on our inheritance. That beautiful picture that God gives us uh, to help us understand what it is that He has done with us, is that of a will. It, 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 God wrote in His will that all people should be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. In order for a will to be executed, then, somebody has to die, and Jesus died, so that God's will would go into effect. The beauty of what God did is that Jesus then is raised from the dead to also be the executor of the will. And the will says that everybody who believes in Jesus should inherit eternal life. That, that image also is prevalent throughout the New Testament, that we become sons of God. And that the children of God are those who inherit that which God has for them in His will. So the Holy Spirit then acts as the proof, the guarantee, that we will inherit what God has for us. John preached, one more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the straps of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So as we continue our Christian journey, our pilgrimage in this life, and we focus on it during these Sundays before Christmas, we look back to the coming of the one more powerful, the one who would baptize us with the Holy Spirit. And we live in that baptism as the Holy Spirit opens the Word to us, teaches us, and guides us as the Holy Spirit comforts us through the trials of this life. And as the Holy Spirit is for us the down payment of our inheritance. Let's pray. Gracious God in heaven, we do give you thanks that you sent Jesus to be the final and perfect sacrifice to take away our sin, that you sent Jesus to take our place in the punishment for sin, that he died the death we deserve that we might have the forgiveness of sin and the declaration of innocence that is His. 
And we thank you that as we live in that fellowship to which you have invited us, you have given us the Holy Spirit. You have sealed us with that promise. And we ask that the Holy Spirit would continue His work in us to open Your Word to us that we might have faith, to comfort and be with us as we continue to wait eagerly for Your return, Lord Jesus. And that we would have the certainty that we are heirs of the kingdom, as the Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance. We ask Jesus in your precious name.